Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. I have been working very diligently on a expose video essay on the claims of J. Warner Wallace regarding his conversion into Christianity using a technique called forensic statement analysis or statement analysis or sometimes scan, scientific content analysis. I also did an interview which has already been posted up on my YouTube channel with Dr. Kip Davis regarding using this technique for the purposes of analyzing ancient documents. So my discussion today in this interview is with Bob Schaefer. He's the senior instructor at LSAT, Investigative Statement Analysis. Uh, he's been a teacher of this for many years. He, anyways, it's a, it's, this is a very interesting conversation. I thought I'd po just post the whole interview of, of my discussion with him, which I was using for research for this other video. So if you're interested in the Jay Warner Wallace story, uh, please look for that video. If you're, I'd like if to say just a couple things, caveats here. The scan technique or statement analysis is controversial. In my, in my video essay, I present quite a few experts that say that it doesn't do what LSI and others claim. Now, in my discussion with Bob Schaefer, and also I talked to um, I, I talked to somebody else that, that teaches this. It sounds to me like the, it's a very legitimate tool for certain applications, but once it goes beyond that border, then it breaks down and it's no longer um, appropriate. So Bob seems very forthright that it's not a proof. It can't be used definitively that it's a strong investigative tool and that it helps him and in, in his training, he likes to teach people to use this tool to help them in their investigations, but that you can't just take a statement and say, okay, this is definitively proof one way or the other. I'll let you listen for yourself, and you can decide how much you think this is valid or not for both its intended use and for use on ancient documents. My name is uh, Bob Schaefer. I'm a retired police lieutenant with a uh, Colorado Municipal um, police department. I was there for 37 years. Um, so in regarding my area of expertise, um, since 1996, well, it's in 1996, I took my first statement analysis class and just for explanation, um, statement analysis is the, is the, uh, process of examining people's language, what they said and how they said it to determine whether or not their story uh, comes from memory, which would suggest truthfulness, or whether it's their memory that's been altered, edited, filtered, and manipulated to create a different impression, i.e. deception. So um, I took my first class in 1996, and I uh, took several other classes from the same instructor his name is Abinom Sapir and um he he's internationally recognized as the the um most knowledgeable person he's kind of credited with putting this uh technique together and it's a technique that is um made up of several different disciplines uh areas of examination research study etc and um uh, psychology some other things as well so anyway, I learned from him. Can, can I, I can I can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah. In ninety in nineteen ninety four, sure. ninety five, ninety six, is it yeah. true that that he was the he was like the originator of teaching this technique? Like if somebody took a class in the mid nineties, it would have been with him, right? There wasn't anyone else yet. You know, is that true? No, not that I know of. If there was, it was somebody that had kind of ripped off his stuff, and you know how you, okay. you get a student in the class and think, oh, I can teach this. And uh, sure, but but he was yeah he was absolutely back in uh, the nineties uh, he was recognized as the I want to call him the international expert and the I'm, I'm gonna use, I have to pick my word carefully developer of this technique which is uh, he didn't invent it it's it's a combination of, of um, um, composite of a lot of different areas or disciplines, uh, areas of study, research, et cetera. So he put them all together and um, saw the correlations between the two, how one area of examination uh, correlated, uh, corroborated 
or supported the others. And um, so you saw a trend, in other words, all these different areas of examination of language. There's a trend, like connecting thread or theme between all of them. And uh, so he's credited with that. And um, I studied under him for a couple of years. I taught for him for a couple of years. And then uh, uh, we went our different ways. And uh, I had had a lot of success with it, using it in investigations. So I had a lot of people say, hey, I'd like to learn how to do that. Would you teach me how to do it? And so 26 years later, um, that's that's what I do. Is Okay. Uh, hey, and you're, so your I'm company is a little now. bit, your company is a little bit different. Linguistic, linguistic statement analysis technique that the course you teach is based on this, but it also includes some of your own experience or your own personal techniques and yeah. so forth. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah. That it, it was a foundation, a basis of, of, of uh, knowledge and education there and uh, took that and uh, tried to expand on it. So, and I just teach. Okay. I basically teach investigators, criminal, private investigators, special investigators, how to use it in their, uh, in their workplace. Okay. Now I actually got your name. I was referred to you by Stanley Burke, who teaches an ex FBI guy that also teaches something similar. Are you familiar sure. with his work? I know his okay, name. So, yeah. yeah. So he told me that um, this tool is, is very good for the thing that you just described. In other words, analyzing if if you if you have a witness to a crime you want to you want to freshly as soon as you can get them to commit and write down some stuff so that you can analyze for deception or truthfulness but that but that it doesn't it's not like a, a proof per se so it's more like a polygraph that kind of helps you see like it's not a hundred you can't go to court and say hey this guy this thing proves no. that he's lying or okay and he also said the idea of this uh being used on a two thousand year old document that was originally written in Greek doesn't work because one you're not analyzing the it's 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 a writing of a writing and somebody's taken time and written out um you know I'm, I'm referring to the like the new testament gospels even if it's based on a witness testimony for instance it's it's they've had time to make a literary composition of what the witness told them and they wrote it in greek and now we're looking at it two thousand years later so um, my, my curiosity here is the claim that you could use these techniques to prove that the veracity of the gospel seems to me a big stretch. Would you concur with that? Or what's your opinion on, on that use? Yeah. It, it, um, proof is uh, too strong of a word. And so uh, I, there, there was a time a few years ago where uh, out of curiosity, I thought in, I'll be straight up front with you. I'm, I'm a believer. Okay. Um, but I'm also a detective, and I know the um, the pitfalls in making assumptions and having preconceived notions, and you know, having a goal in mind and, and working to prove that goal. I just let the evidence take sure. Care of the thing. So, with that said, I thought, in in my view, the maybe the greatest historical account or story told by somebody uh, would be maybe the creation story. So I thought, well, I'm going to analyze that now. And see where it takes me. So what I did, and, and what you said is is, is correct. Um, uh, proof is a pretty strong standard. Um, evidence, that's as an investigator, that's what I look at. You know, all these little things mm -hmm. that add up to is the story believable. With that said, um, I was uh, took what I believed or what I was advised would be the closest literal translation of greek well in this case mine would have been uh ancient hebrew um but uh -huh. literal translation so and um that's the best they had to, to work with. and uh in the case that you're talking about sorry i moved my steering wheel i'm in my car <laughs> and um, <laughs> no problem yeah and um uh if it was a new testament uh i would have to find what would be generally uh considered to be the uh most literal translation not interpretation but translation word for word in order to come to, to maximize or at least elevate the, the accuracy of the technique uh-huh well it, it, so in the case of in the case of say um mark so traditional christian scholars believe mark was sort of a, a scribe or a secretary for peter now um 
more critical scholarship doesn't buy into that. But even if we grant that's the case, uh, Mark would be writing down what Peter told him about Jesus, and he would have time, perhaps over the course of years, to to you know if you've ever written if you've ever written a book or even a paper, you you have to go back and kind of edit yourself and clean up your writing. Now, so this is not what you, right. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not what a witness, if, if you've arrested somebody because you think they've witnessed or they're participated in a bank robbery, robbery, for instance, you're not going to give them a year to write their statement, right? You want a fresh off the well, cuff under duress statement, so correct? The important thing is, so let's put it in some pre, in basic um, terms. So let's say that you murder somebody and that's what your memory knows. It knows uh -huh. you murdered somebody. And it knows it whether it's 20 minutes later or 20 years later. And so okay. knowledge of that murder is still, that memory is the foundation of the statement. So now, yeah, some of the detail might be lost now, but but you, it's still going to, if you said, no, I didn't do it, you're still lying, and your language could reveal that. Now, you said Mark. Now, Mark, um, of the four Gospels, and I think you were talking about the Gospels, I think. Um, yes. But uh, Matthew and John are the only ones that would be considered eyewitnesses. Um, the other two were secondary sources. Uh, Luke and Mark were told Correct. the story and then re retold it. And uh, I would not take the, as an investigator, I would not take this. Well, let's put it in police terms. Um, if a witness, whether that's a victim suspect or um, a witness, tells the police officer when he says, hey, tell me what happened, and he writes a police report, I can't tell, cannot tell from his report whether that person's telling the truth or not. It has to be their words from their own memory from here to here in the pen. Uh, it travels 18 inches to get into the, the piece of paper. Or okay. So, so, yeah, so, so a secondary right. source is not an accurate source of information. No. Right. That this would, this would, this would enter, this would, this would cause the, the technique that you use to be unusable because you're now, you're, you couldn't analyze Mark's interpretation of right. Peter's yeah. memory, right? Yeah, it, Is that it correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Now, with that, okay. with that now, said, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, um, I can't remember what I was going to say. Go ahead. Oh, well, so so let's let's look at, at Matthew's account. Now, Matthew's, a good third of Matthew is verbatim of Mark. So So Matthew, and Luke does the same. A good portion of Matthew and Luke are verbatim uh, Greek and or the Septuagint quote. So what scholars say is those parts, they've just taken Mark and they've just copied it exactly because because the count doesn't need to change. They're just saying what Mark got was exactly right. Here's the verse. It's the same. If you look at the Greek, it's the same. Then there's some changes. So what you're saying is on those changes where they've added more detail, as long as we agree on the premise that that's their own words, then you're saying the technique would work on their own words, but not on the part where it's a copy of Mark, correct? Well, well okay, so to go back a little bit, uh, th this technique is a compilation of a lot of different areas of, of research, not just word choice. Um, there's a lot of things that are looked at and shy of teaching you the class here, which is impossible. Um, Word no, I've got, yes, I yeah, understand. Word choice is one small, well, it's, not, it's a major slice of the pie, but it's just one slice of the pie. There's a lot of other things we can look at. Now, what it can tell you, though, is whether that person thinks, well, let's put it this way. Um, if I analyze, which I did, Genesis, and I mm -hmm. determine that yeah, there's no deception detected, that just tells me that whoever wrote that thinks it's true. It doesn't Correct. prove whether it happened. It proves that they sincerely believe what they are saying is true. And um, uh, now there's a certain component of that that would say because they think it's true, there's there's reasons for that. And it, it, it does, to a degree, uh, uh, I would say support the story or lend credibility to the story. But it, what it really tells you is whether that person thinks they're telling the truth they are telling the truth or not. Let me give you an example. So if you and I go to a convenience store and the place is robbed, or I'm, I'll tell you what, well, um, 
uh, yeah, the place is robbed while you and I are there. And the cops come and they say, hey, okay, Michael, write me a statement. Tell me what happened. And they say, Bob, you go to your opposite corner and you write a statement. Tell me what you happened. Our stories are going to be at a superficial level the same. But you might mm -hmm. say, well, the guy was wearing a green shirt. And I might say, well, I saw a guy come in with a blue shirt. And you might say, well, I saw a guy with a black revolver robbed it. And I might say, well, I saw a guy with a silver semi-automatic pistol. Some of the details are going to be different just because of our, we're different people, different perceptions. Right. Different. And so it, it, it does, the, the process tells, what, but even though some of the facts are incorrect, it tells the reader or the investigator that you think you're telling the truth. You're not intending to deceive. And I'm not intending to deceive either. And so it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, determine well it can, which which account is factual, objectively factual. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so it, there are those those. There's there's that. Now, what if what, what if what what are and, and are are you of the the position that let's say. The police ask me to to write down what happened in the bank robbery, and let's say I'm in the bathroom and I don't see anything, and but I want to I want to be in the spotlight, so I make up a story. Oh yeah, and I, happens, let's say yeah. I'm a yeah, and let's say but let's say I'm a very good storyteller. What you're saying is your technique would would catch would trip me up. Yeah, but, absolutely. But it still, yeah. but but it still wouldn't necessarily prove that I was lying. It would just show that I'm intending to deceive. No, well, that's the same. Okay, so yeah. you bring up a point, and it's a technicality. But lying and deceiving aren't really exactly the same thing. A lie is a story or a portion of a story that has no foundation in truth. If I say, "Hey, I walked on the moon last week," that's just a flat-out lie. Um, okay. But a deception takes a story, it takes the reality, something that actually happened, and it manipulates it and distorts it um, through some language strategies and some style strategies and some emotional strategies um so if, if you murder somebody uh you would and somebody says hey michael tell me what happened you you could tell the story of how you killed somebody but you're going to make it look like it was an accident or you're going to make it look like it was self-defense or it was a suicide the guy committed suicide while you're there so it doesn't uh, take so much sort of half truths like a, a little bit of half truths and income stuff. Incomplete no. truths. Yeah. And part of the strategy right. for deception is to omit critical information. And we know yeah. how the brain does that. It's hardwired into the human brain. Every person on the face of the earth that ever existed deceives in exactly the same way. It's a, it's a template. It's a format. Uh, okay. That, Would this be true they, even for somebody with uh, some somebody that was clinically sociopathic, had no empathy, and was a good storyteller? Would, so, would they still would get caught in that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because they know it's not true. And so, so the, the part of the brain that would be, be considered to be factual or real is, is your memory. It's like, a, it's like a videotape. It records it. It doesn't have any judgment about it. it. just It's a recording. It's the conscious mind that when that memory comes back and you're asked to tell that story, they say, Michael, hey, tell me about Bill Smith's death. And I think you did. You're going to remember that you murdered him right but so that when that memory comes back into your conscious mind your conscious mind says i can't tell that truth i have to I have to change it a little bit i have to distort mm -hmm. that so the subconscious mind is completely truthful that's all it knows the, the conscious mind is the one that says i can't i can't say what really happened because that's a confession and so okay. what happens is it creates a conflict between the subconscious mind in the, in the conscious mind, the subconscious mind goes, tell the truth. That's all it knows. The conscious mind goes, I can't. And so that's how, as a police officer, we gain confessions. We work the person's subconscious against them. We, we, okay. we, we uh, nurture memory, which is in conflict with the conscious mind. And it comes out in the form of language distortions and trends. There's, there's trends of deceptive thought. Uh, there's and do you words. believe... I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you believe those do you believe those trends and those pronouns and the adjectives and the in the the uh, you know I've seen some of your your papers where you have different color coding and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. Would that would that still work on Greek and how so because 
unless unless you know Greek, you wouldn't know what the norms were. You wouldn't know like how would you know what the pronouns or adjective well, differences that doesn't seem like it would make it would translate. It, most of it translates. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, if I'm not mistaken, you live in Mexico, right? Are you in Mexico? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. So in, in Spanish, um, uh, the verb itself suggests the, the the perspective that it's told from. In other words, you don't always have to use the pronoun, you know, uh, for I or you. It, it's suggested in the verb. But um, all right. Yeah. But so, uh, but again, this is a, this is a human thought process issue it's not a language issue what it reveals is a thought okay. process in other words a person who speaks russian is deceptive in exactly the same way that a person that speaks english or spanish i had actually taught the class in the united arab emirates in in arabic and in spanish uh -huh. um and all i needed to have was somebody that could inter not interpret translate the language for me and so um okay uh so yeah it's it's valid it's even valid for sign language even a person that okay. can, and we can, did, is it, yeah, it eliminates some of the components of it. Sure. The vast sure. majority of it is a reflection of a person's thought. And that's really what it is. It's, it's the closest thing we so, have. But to, you would, you would, you would have to do it in the language. So maybe you don't know Russian or you don't know Greek, yeah. but somebody translate it properly, then you could yeah. do the analysis, even if you don't know the language, because yeah. it's been, it's been properly translated, yeah. but you couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't do it in English on a document that was originally in a different language without first translating. Otherwise, the words might not even match, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, there is that possibility. Yeah, that, and, and um, whoever, uh, whatever uh, person that you were in your email to me, you said you were looking at a, a certain person's work. And uh, uh, in order to be, to be able to make a claim that yeah, this is true or whatever. Uh, that person would have had to do their due diligence to make sure that the language that was in the English version was properly translated. And um, yes, well, and so it, when I said, you know, I did Genesis, well, I just went to it. I didn't. I didn't go back to ancient Hebrew. I just picked mm -hmm. what people said. This is the closest thing we've got to a, a precise translation, not an interpretation. And so, yeah, right. you know. Um, well, okay, but in that case, in that case, the 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 Jews that wrote that obviously believe God created the world, so yeah. they wouldn't be deceptive. But that it wouldn't prove the truth claim; it would just prove they believe that they were recording honest, honestly, correct? Yes, yeah. like they would. Yeah. They they believed it. Yeah, and then so, and then well, you know, and you know, you know as well as I do that that you know, true people believe that that is God inspired. That God picked that language. He picked yes. the words uh, very, very intentionally, and um, so there's always that argument for it. But, but I'll admit straight up front, my analysis is I'll admit that it's it's got that potential weakness to it, and uh, and um, that. Uh, I, but even even if it didn't, even if I knew ancient Hebrew, I anybody who's responsible and i'm going to say honest about it um uh should admit to themselves i might be wrong i mean every time i analyze yeah. a criminal statement and i still do that for places i say look this is my findings and i feel extremely confident that what i found is the reality they did it and this is where they're lying and this is how to catch them um yeah. but i always have a caveat which is i might be wrong i don't think i am there's a, probably a 90% right. chance, 95, that I'm right. And in the empirical data, if you want to call it that, or historical, my experience is that I'm right. I feel very confident in that. Um, and if, after 26 years of doing it and then comparing the result of the investigation to what I found builds the credibility of the technique. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And it brings up another question I have now about the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John varies from the synoptics in that's partly why the synoptics are called the synoptics because they're very similar, right? Yeah. So sure. in 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 modern scholarship, including Christian scholars, they not now not everybody agrees on this, but it this seems to be the consensus that John is using literary techniques and conventions when he 
deviates from the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not that he's lying. It's not that he's not being honest, but it's not an eyewitness verbatim thing or exactly what happened because he's he's using a flavor because he's trying to present. In other words, he's trying to, he calls Jesus um, the Lamb of God and he uses other phrases that appear nowhere else. So, so modern scholarship and even evangelical believers say, well, he's using literary techniques because he's a brilliant writer. Now, if that were true, and I'm not asking you to comment if you believe that or not, but sure. if that were true, would that then show that you can't use these techniques on it because he's writing as he's putting flair and he's using con- writerly conventions? So the technique doesn't take those things into consideration. Um, it, it strictly looks at what trend of thought is there. Is it from memory or are there clues, we'll call it clues or evidence that, that memory is being altered. So, uh, and that's one of the, the uh, things that, uh, sorry, that um, uh, people, when I explain to them how the technique works, especially detectives, uh, um, there, let me put it this way, there is no such thing as a good liar. People are good liars mm-hmm. because they use those tech, those strategies that you're talking about. So if, if okay. I'm interviewing, I know, uh, uh, a good liar, they sell it. They sell their lie with voice inflection and with facial expressions and tone of voice and sure. enthusiasm. Sure. And you don't, we don't have to deal with those human elements when we analyze language. And, um, mm-hmm. and so style is really irrelevant uh, in the whole thing. And so we can okay. weed, through, yeah, weed through the yeah, human well, that, element. Yeah. That, that, makes, that makes sense. I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, but I'm still a little confused. When, when Mark, Matthew, and Luke put the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus' ministry, because that, this is like what finally pushes the Jewish leaders over the edge. And they, 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 like he's cleansed the temple. He's, really, he's gone over the line. And John moves that incident to the beginning of his ministry three years earlier. So obviously both of those accounts can't be true. So Christian, Chris, what Christian scholars say is that John moved it there because he had uh, literary purposes for doing it, not because it literally happened that. And they don't see that as a conflict in in hurting anyone's faith, or they're not trying to they're not trying to show John as not being giving an honest story. But it right. can't be true. G- Jesus couldn't have. It, it, it was either at the beginning of his ministry or at the end of his ministry. So how would something like that be reflected when you looked at it in terms of analyzing it? John does. John's not trying to deceive anybody, but it's not an eyewitness account of what actually happened because he puts it three years in a different place. Well, that could be, well, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, I'm thinking out loud here about if I were to, and I have not analyzed those, but I would have to look Uh at the language and, and, well, the language is going to be different. And when I say language, I'm talking about um, words, phrases, content, structure, the speed, the rate at which it's told, the quantity of information. There's, there's dozens of things we look at. Um, if if Jesus doing that actually happened, then the account of that would be shown be shown to be truthful. It being out of chronological sequence wouldn't necessarily might, but wouldn't necessarily show deception. Uh, okay, if because you, the event itself yeah. the event itself happened, but but he's just moved around the. Yeah. The sequence of the stories that that wouldn't yeah. that wouldn't matter so much yeah. and so and as so we can look at it from the example i gave before about you and me going to 7-eleven to get a slurpee and the place gets robbed over there you give your version of the story and, mind, and those there might be small sequential or chronological sequence issues that are not consistent between you and me and, and right and it's just our perception of things uh now i could be wrong but i think i and I should probably should know this before I say it, but is John's gospel not the first one written, or is it? No, John's yeah. the last. Go- John John is the very last. So the um the uh, yeah, and so um yeah, that was written when he was like old. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, see, it, most most scholars, even 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 very conservative Christian scholars, yeah, put it last and se- several decades after yeah. the earlier ones were written. Yeah. So, yeah. so so he so he, he 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 might have he might actually have access to the Synoptic yeah. Gospels when he sure. writes it. Yeah, and and um and so, but would that show it to be deceptive? It just depends on the individual person. It me- depends okay. on what his intent is. It's just like if he knows that it's not true, it's going to be reflect- reflected in the language. If he if he believes it is true, it's not going to be reflected in that. So you mentioned before, like a, a psychopath, a psych, uh, um, well, okay, somebody with no empathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's irrelevant. What they know is that the facts that they're telling are true, and it's going to be reflected in the language. Um, so they're susceptible to that. Um, and so as long as I would have to say, honestly, no, I, yeah, that, yeah, that that I some, understand what I understand yeah. what you're saying. It's like, what, okay. what's the person feels and, and what they recall. But now with that, with that also show, let's say, let's say I honestly believe I had an encounter with, with a vampire or a ghost. And I really believed it because, you know, I, for whatever reason, yeah. and I wrote that down with that sh- would the, would the analysis show, hey, he's not being deceptive? But of yeah. course, it wouldn't mean you would believe in vampires, right? Right. Yeah. It would show that you were. I get that all the time. I had I've had statements that came from people that were um, um, psychopaths, not psychopath, um, not delusional. I'm trying to think. Um, schizophrenic. Okay. And they believe what they hear is real. They believe what they see that that the. the um, Sure, is actually happening. Their statements are not true. A person right. is delusional. They have a, a, a in, inaccurate perception of what's really happening in front of them. Um, they yeah, come out true. It's what they believe. And uh, now, uh, I, I've had even just a statement yesterday where a person heard a story. And they were getting their. Uh, they actually projected that in their statement as though they had at least partially witnessed it. Right. Okay. Which was not true. And okay. we, we caught it. It's like they, that language is, is, is um, symptomatic of somebody who didn't actually witness it, but wants us to think that they did. And so it's a pretty, um, pretty valuable tool. Uh, perfect. No. And, uh, but it's a great, let me put it, when I use it, I feel that it leads me the right direction. Yeah. That, uh, well, I could does... see how I could, I could see how this is yeah. what Stanley Burke told me was that, yeah. that if you're at, let's say you have four or five witnesses and, and one of them comes across the analyst, the, you analyze their statement and it seems very much like they're not trying to deceive you. And somebody else is a little bit more deceptive. You would now know which investigative lines to take. Exactly. It would save you time yeah, yeah, yeah. and resources. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but in your your example of John actually believes that the cleansing of the temple happened. Then it that's that it's that event that's going to his description that's going to tell us whether we actually believed it or not. What chronological order it comes in probably isn't going to play as big a role in it, um, right? As that it is, it just happened. Yeah. So with with Luke and Mark, who are both not eyewitnesses, so so they're they're getting it from another thing. Their story could show up as completely being honest, no deception, because they are believing everything that they're being told by other people, right? Um, well, only if they're claiming that they did witness it. So well, right. So they... so if Mark if Mark believes Peter witnessed Jesus doing a miracle, for instance, and Mark believes Jesus. Then Mark, then Mark's writing will show that he's not being deceptive. Well, it but shows it's, he, it shows he believes Peter. It doesn't right, exactly. mean that he exactly. believes it, that the event that Peter's talking about is the equivalent of of the officer taking the witness statement and then trying to claim what somebody. It has to be. Right. It has to be a first account. Yeah. Right. So if, so if it's, he's so talking it, about so, if he's talking about I, Peter's Peter's travels and Peter's ministry, then it's going to be true. If he's if he's talking about what Peter is preaching, he's getting it secondhand. That that disqualifies it in my eyes. Now, so uh, I would never right. Take so it that would be the story. same. The, yeah. So that would be the same with Luke as a historian or any historian. If you're a historian taking other people's accounts, 
analyzing your statements might show that you're being, you're not being deceptive. You're writing what you believe the people told you. Yeah. Are, are you you're writing what they said, but that doesn't you're, mean you necessarily believe it or that it necessarily happened. Yeah, he's writing about the interaction with the the person who's telling the story, not the story right. itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's perfectly clear now. Okay. And that's why well, people I think that with well, well, I, well in, 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 on occasion, look at a statement where after it's been told in their mind, it's a deceptive statement. They're, it's it's a person who did it. They're the guilty person. They tell right. that story enough. People say, well, is there a point where they get to where they actually believe what they're saying? And the answer is no. But what, why their statements after a period of time will come across as truthful is because their recollection is not of the event. It's of them telling the story. They're, they're, yes, they're, that's, that's very true. Do you remember, this is probably around, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's in your time, when they had the, the, the satanic scares in LA, there was a huge, it was one of the biggest cases at the time. It ended up being a, a a huge a huge fiasco and a multi million. The, I think the state ended up having to pay huge damages because the witness the children were coached into. Oh yeah, yeah, there was yeah, yeah. The, the, the daycare center. Yes, that one. Yeah, the, oh, the I know Mc, it very well. Case. Yeah, the I McMartin well. case. So, so those kids were were taught stuff and then they believed it, and they came across as effective. The, are you telling me that if you had been able to do a a written statement and now maybe they're too young to even write but if they had been able to do a witness statement you might have been able to tell deception or no if they believe well, it so much it's your lot you're not able to tell yeah not in the, that case because this is um when i say it's good for any human being in the face of the earth that's any adult human being so uh children okay, okay. Have, have not yet mastered the art of deception and lying um and they, uh, okay. their, their vocabulary is not extensive enough they haven't mastered the language and they, you people are essentially kind of – it requires an adult thought process. I, I don't analyze any statement from anybody under 13 years old. It's always got to okay. be an adult thought process. Yeah. Sure. So if they're too young that they can be – they could be told – and they basically form a false memory, and then they're, they're telling yeah. you the memory, which they believe the memory, but it didn't actually happen. Is that – right? in a nutshell, yeah. that's kind of what's going Although, on. Yeah, okay. I, I've had people come in um, as adults, you know, 12, 15, 20 years later, say, hey, my uncle sexually assaulted me or my grandfather sexually assaulted me. Okay, tell me the story. And um, it, those stories a lot of times come out deceptive. And a lot okay. of times it's because it didn't happen. When we look right. at they, they've been coached, but even the subconscious knows, the conscious mind doesn't, but the subconscious knows it didn't happen. There's no actual memory of it. The memory you're talking okay. about, the coaching part, is in a different part of the brain. And so when oh, you okay. keep the memory, um, then it's like your story isn't coming across as truthful. And it's a lot of times, and I hate to say this because you probably got a lot of victims, advocates, or whatever, they, but a lot of times they don't tell the truth. Or they've been coached to believe something that's not true, but the subconscious knows it, and it will it'll betray that person in their, in their language. So... Right. If that yeah, makes no, I'm aware. I'm aware. I, you know, it makes perfect sense. I read some of those cases and um, I, I have some personal experience with somebody that I know that went through sure. some bad counseling who thought things happened that obvious that were impossible to have happened. And, yeah. you know, she got a lot of therapy afterward and, and worked it out. But I can see how if you're if you're a good therapist could actually implant something and by good, I yeah. mean good at doing that. Yeah. And then you would you would you would really believe something because your mind's recalling the memory, not the actual yeah. event. There, there, what happens with those, you know, these delayed memories, so to speak, and things like, is that your subconscious knows what it knows, and it's they're trying to force a square peg into a round hole, and so you've got yeah what you're being coached and what really happened, and there's that conflict, and that's why people have such a psychologically and emotionally it's hard times because there's that conflict inside that they just can't reconcile. And right. the, okay. language, the language doesn't lie. And the thing about statement analysis is that people can't control it. There is no control over it. You can't do it. I can't even do it. Given one opportunity to tell a story, there's so many components to it that I might be able to control, you know, my pronoun use or something, um, but I can't control all of it. Um, the subconscious, the subconscious says, tell whatever story you want, but I'm picking the language. 
and the language mm-hmm. is always going to betray the deceptive person. So um, not to get away from your topic, but um, um, all that all that that apologist can really say is that whoever, whoever, and I don't even know how good the person is at statement analysis. It's only as good as the user. Um, yeah, uh, and I've got people that have studied with me, and I analyze their work. And it's like, oh, geez, they know better than that, or there's a mistake here. It's only as good as the user. Sure. And I have no idea what the proficiency level is of the person you know that that you were talking about. Yeah, well, yeah. This this is this detective took the course in roughly 94 or 95 according to his testimony and he said he sure. took whatever the full course was now yeah. he doesn't mention he doesn't mention lsi but i think that's the only option that's the only one available i think at the time yeah i didn't start my yeah. teaching until about 2003 or four so yeah. yeah so it's way yeah it's considerably later so then he says he read the gospel of, of mark and within a month of using like lsi or excuse me using forensic statement analysis that that he knew that it, that like these were true witness statements and that and that Mark was really the Mark was really the scribe of Peter but if that but if what you're telling me is true that he couldn't have even done this on Mark that's impossible because Mark's a reporter and you're and I if I'm understanding you you're saying you can't use it on the reporter you if you could if you could analyze Peter's right. writing it would work but not yes. Mark now, yeah okay so so that can't like his technique or whatever, even if he was good at it after a week of training, that would have been impossible to use it the way that he used it. It would be unlikely. Right, and we're not, yeah. I'm not asking you, I'm not, I'm not asking you about Matthew or, or John, which may, may be a different case. I'm asking Mark. you specifically about Mark and Mark yeah. is not an eyewitness and he's writing stuff down that he believes. I'm mean, presumably he believes it's true that Peter's telling him it's true. But analyzing a statement doesn't tell you anything other than he believed Peter. Yes. Yeah. All the analysis can do is analyze the language of the author. In other words, okay. Mark's experience. He, we can't analyze yeah. Peter's experience or Jesus' experience. The only thing experience that we can analyze actually is what did Mark hear and what did he do and what did he see? Right. This person. Anything beyond that. It's just uh, it, it's it's kind of um, uh, I want to say irresponsible to do that. Yeah, and um, and maybe he's right. Well, my issue, be, my issue. A... I mean, yeah. Well, so so the thing is this this particular this particular um, police officer parlayed this. So he you may have seen him on Dateline. This is I'm talking about Jay Warner Wallace. Have you ever heard that name on Dateline? He did a bunch of cold case stuff. In the, the name sounds like two thousand and ten. So he was on Dateline part because so he's a he was in the Torrance Police Department, which is near Burbank and the NBC studios. Yeah. So it's very convenient. And also Torrance was wealthy enough to have two full time cold case detectives that did that was their whole job. They weren't doing yeah. it. And the, and, the nice and they luxury. started yeah. doing these. Yeah, it was a nice luxury. And they also started doing it before. Um Bef- well, they started doing it right at the beginning of DNA starting to come into use, which was yeah, like the mid nineties, like late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, yeah. So then, then by the by two thousand and I want to say two thousand twelve, thirteen, somewhere in there, or maybe sometime after two thousand and ten, uh, some some smart person figured out that the ancestry sites might be a mine, a gold mine, uh, right. and then they they started using that. So so eventually. The, the need for a full-time cold case detective became uh, it became unnecessary because there's no work to do once you've submitted the DNA. You're waiting for a hit. Like it might take a year, it might take a month, it might take 10 years. So yeah. they cleaned up a bunch of cases using um in it, not using investigative techniques on figuring out who did it. They already knew who did it. Yeah. So that the six cases they closed. The district attorney knew who the killer was. He just couldn't go to court. He didn't have enough. So they went back through those old cases and they were able to build cases. And that became very exciting for NBC, which is why they were on Dateline a lot. Sure. So my argument, my complaint, because he's sold millions of dollars of books and courses and he's a big celebrity now. My my argument with him is the idea that you use these analytic techniques on the book of Mark to originally become a Christian is that it's 
it's irrelevant that you did that because it doesn't work the way you say it. So that doesn't mean Christianity isn't true. It's just you can't believe it's true on that evidence. That evidence yeah. is not that evidence is bad. Yep. Yeah. Um yeah, and we and we could get into a big philosophical discussion about that. That wouldn't be the way to to become one anyway. It's it's just not the way that it works. Um and um uh but yeah, I I I even as a believer and whatever, um I would be very skeptical. Let me put it this way, that analysis of Mark could come maybe in it may help to build your faith or support it, but it's it's out of sequence. It's not the first step. And yeah. um, it would be building a, a, a belief on a weak foundation. And um it, it and that's that this doesn't work. Um and so yeah. uh, now but to say that what Mark wrote isn't true, I can't say that. Um yes. It's no, and I talked to a Christian. Yeah, I, I I talked to a Christian scholar who said um, that the the he you know he believes Jesus rose from the dead and he believes in Christianity, but he he basically said the the technique of of using a forensic statement analysis on Mark he has no knowledge of that in his and you know in yeah. his specialty and so. My my thought was, well, wait a minute. If if Bible colleges, if Bible colleges and history departments aren't using this technique in that way, they certainly would if the research showed that it was good enough yeah. to say, hey, we can base a foundation on this. And they're not doing that, so that says something to me. So it seems like he's a lone wolf saying, hey, this this technique I used in '95 really worked great, and I, I and so I'm so, challenging yeah. that. Well, and so, um, it. Uh... It is it, it is actually a way of studying the Bible, though. But that's after you, if you're looking at it to prove or to say, yeah, I'm my my belief is hinged on whether or not I can believe this language. Then it's a weak foundation. But um, there are Bible studies that loosely follow that same type of technique, and uh, maybe not um, as in depth. But mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I've been to some Bible studies. Like, hey, somebody picked up on that. That's exactly what we look 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 at. So there are right. This it's not a magic technique. In fact, if you were to take the class, you realize that okay, a lot of this stuff is just should be common knowledge um, of way yeah. of looking at things. And so, it, but to, to to say you should base your faith on or n or not on that analysis is. Um, I think it's kind of irresponsible. Yeah, we, and, yeah, uh, that was my that was my opinion too. That it wasn't fair to to try to bolster somebody's faith on stuff that that when they, I mean, they learn later that this is not even this is faulty research or faulty or, like, or, or it's jumping to conclusions that aren't fair. It's better to um, so so. In other words, the 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 teacher, the guy that the the Christian that I interviewed on this, it's a professor. He teaches it. Houston Christian. Now, you know, we have different worldviews and so forth, but I respect his scholarship and kind of what I, what my position was, if you're going to use scholars, you want to use somebody that's being, that's well-trained and is using valid techniques that are accepted among scholars and is, is, and is being honest about, for instance, the fact that, that Matthew and Luke have a large portion that's directly copied from Mark. And it's because they're they're not going to reinvent the wheel. Mark said this happened. That was good enough for them, and they just copied it exactly. But as a witness, that's you can't use a collusion. Right. It's it's a verbatim thing. That doesn't yeah. count. You you have to look at stuff that's that's original to the person that's writing it down or telling you the story for this for this technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and of course, you know, anybody who does research is always going to talk to somebody who learn what they know from someplace else they're not always first hand or first person um the person who experienced it so um yeah, you know no. research out of books and talking to people and other artifacts and things like that so it um it doesn't uh it doesn't yeah and we, we already stated that it doesn't say that what yeah. mark said isn't true it says that um it's it kind of i'm yeah. 
cautiously use the word irresponsible to say you've proven the gospel of Mark to be true based on a statement analysis. That's just not even in a police investigation. It, um, I don't use the, the, the results of analysis to build an affidavit for an arrest. It just leads my investigation. It tells me which direction do I need to go, uh, which is the which is going to get right. me to the reality, and it's it's the investigative work that builds the case. The, the analysis just tells me I'm going the right yeah. direction. Yeah. And this would you you would like to use this in conjunction with other tools, maybe like a polygraph or some other corroborating yeah. evidence or you know, yeah. video recordings and so forth. And then and that we, would help build that would help yeah. it strengthen your confidence you're going the right way. Well, and typically what I do, and this might relate to maybe to what you know, something you'd have, but um I would do an independent analysis, independent of the investigation. The investigation would take one path, my analysis would take another path. And there's this point where we converge and we say, I'll mm -hmm. say, they would say, well, tell, or let me tell you what I know. And I say, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what I found based on the language and see if it corroborates what they found. And okay. nearly always uh, it corroborated. They say, how did you know that? I said, because he told me, he said it yeah. in the language. And so I don't want that outside knowledge. I want to do a parallel investigation and then compare later on and say, you know, are we completely in different directions or is one corroborating the other? And um, that's yeah, how it that, that makes sense. Is, is this similar to um, uh, the the book, The Gift of Fear? Uh, I, I forget the author's name. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Gift of Fear? Uh, the, the name sounds familiar, but I haven't. It, it, yeah. So he talked about you. He 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 ended up he was a police officer that ended up in. Um, I think he consulted with with FBI or, or the, the federal government on certain like yeah. threat assessments. And he would be able to analyze, Hey, this, this letter, this email is just nonsense. It's just no, all yeah. indications show this isn't real, but then a different letter would be, no, the, the language indicates this guy is actually a serious threat. Right. It, truthfulness versus deception. Is he saying okay. just to scare people or is there sincerity and intent behind it? Yeah. And okay. It's, so it's this limited in value in that because i've been asked to do the same thing and uh it's like well that's not exactly the best application for it but it is it can be part of it you know yeah well at least it would help you if you have limited resources and you're getting say a big event and you're and you're getting some threats to people yep you would have to you're going to have to decide how to allocate your resources and you don't want to chase your tail everywhere around town obviously right uh, oh, yeah. so that that would make a lot of sense Yep. Okay. And, and I, was there any, got, is there anything else? Is there anything else that I should have asked you that you can think of that maybe would enlighten me more or did we cover it pretty well? I think we covered it. it it's, um, yeah, it's just understanding really what people like to overstate the value of it. But I know it's in, to me, it's in value. It's just the way I think and the way I look at things. I mean, look at somebody on TV and watch the news and politicians and celebrities and, prominent people and go that person's full of crap they're lying that's not true just based on what right. they say but people like to overstate it and say it's absolute and mm -hmm. i and i have a lot of confidence in my in my statement analysis skills and ability come short of saying that I always preface it there's always a caveat with but i could be wrong yeah. and um, that keeps me from getting into trouble and making claims that i can't prove um, right. It's it's accurate investigation that becomes the proof, and so uh, I'm always very skeptical. Of somebody who says, says "I've proven this, I've proven that," it's like you know, especially when it comes to matters revolving around God. There's no proof one way or yeah. the other on, on the, right. uh, the non-believer side or the believer side. There's this different degrees of evidence, and uh, yes. there's never any proof. Absolutely. So. Um, yeah that seems a fair way to do it yeah and I, and I think i i don't think it's i don't think it's strengthening for people's faith to give them wrong reasons because i could tell you oh well i believe in jesus because a little fairy came and told me and that wouldn't be that, that that's not helpful right so i think we're even though i have different viewpoints i think we're on the same page that that the evidence that you use and the things you strengthen your faith with need to be legitimate yeah, tools, it's going to push not, you one or the other yeah and so you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna, that seems 
if you're going to if you're going to adhere to a philosophy or a, a position, do it based on good, solid what you believe is evidence and not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weak. weak yeah, um, right. You know what I'm trying to say my. My yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think we're in agreement. I think we're in yeah, agreement yeah. on that. And, and it comes down to yeah. no, but it comes down to having having strong integrity and not wanting to oversell the case. You want yeah. to be fair. Yeah, it's like yeah, and and it, I and I think that's reasonable. And I like and I think when they when they overstate something or they <laughs> right they, they, to to prove that the other candidate is wrong, they they ruin their credibility because everybody knows what they said isn't true. And it goes yes. well, it's based on yeah. On the evidence, the solid evidence, but not to say this yeah. can't be a way of developing evidence. It is. It's not the evidence. And, right. Um, right. Yeah. That makes sense. That that makes perfect sense. Sure. Okay. Well, sir, we're coming up on an hour, and I I want to respect yeah. your time. I appreciate this very very much. Um, you really helped solidify some answers in my head and help me understand better. Sorry and... about the quality of, but I'm like say I'm in my truck. Uh, not a problem. <laughs> Please go check out my video essay on Jay Warner Wallace, where I bring in lots of different experts from different viewpoints, and I talk about the claims that he makes regarding both the forensic statement analysis as a valid tool for analyzing the New Testament documents, as well as pointing out using his own words where his story about how he became a Christian simply breaks down. Please like, subscribe, follow. It helps my channel. I'm still trying to build it, and I appreciate your support. This has been Michael Beverly. Thank you.